We will call to order the regular board meeting of the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago. Good morning, my name is Maricel Hernandez. I'm the chair. Seated to my left is Commissioner Jonathan Swain, and to my right is Commissioner William Caressi. Next item on the agenda is the consideration of the agenda. Is there a, a motion to um, take any items out of order? Yes, um, you're, uh, Madam Chair, we'd like to uh, move immediately to item 6A. 7A. 7A, I'm sorry, I forgot my Roman numeral. 7A, okay. under new business. Okay, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Great. So at this point, we will go to the podium and we invite uh, Mila and her parents. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are very pleased to have with us today Mila Lavoni Zidel, uh, who we are honoring today for some wonderfully creative artwork that we are so pleased to be able to salute. Before we get to Mila's creation, I want to tell you a little about her. Perhaps with a bit of inspiration from Mary Lavoni, her mother, who's an artist, Mila always loved fashion. In fact, I understand that Mila began making sketches um, regularly at the age of four. And now we fast forward to high school, and in November 2018, when Mila was a junior at Whitney Young, Mila served as a student judge of election. Mila enjoyed that experience enough that she returned to serve as a student judge of election again in the spring semester of 2019 at both the federal municipal election and the April runoff election. During that same spring semester, Mila had a sort of final exam assignment in a fashion class at Whitney Young. <clears throat> Mila was assigned to create an avant-garde piece. And with the election board's permission, and we certainly had no idea why she wanted hundreds <laughs> of I voted wristbands, Mila created something wonderful. This avant-garde dress that you see here, she managed to create a piece that embraces two eras that were both marked by advancements in civil rights and voting rights. First, you can see the flapper style of the 1920s, which of course, exactly a century ago, marked the ratification and implementation of the 19th Amendment as well as the founding of the League of Women Voters, with women winning suffrage after a struggle that was fought for decades right here in Chicago. At the same time, you see in Mila's avant-garde work a reflection of the fringe suede and go-go looks of the 1960s, the era marked by the Voting Rights Act. Mila added accents of the purse and the power necklace, and created one of the hits at a spring program at Whitney Young. What Mila probably didn't know was that one of our board members, Commissioner Jonathan Swain, happened to be in the audience. When Commissioner Swain mentioned this, we knew we had to have this. And now, Mila, your creation is going to be on display at the election board as we prepare for the century celebration of the 19th Amendment. We're also delighted to honor Mila for two more important milestones, because now as a senior about to graduate from Whitney Young, Mila's going to serve as an election judge again at the March 17th primary election, and at this time, she's registered to vote for the first time, she'll be able to cast a ballot at this primary. So on behalf of the board, um, I would welcome uh, a motion to adopt the resolution to salute this wonderful artwork. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes, <clears throat> and I'd like just to read the resolution. It says, Whereas Mila Lavoni Zadell has served in three elections in 2018 and 2019 as a student election judge with the Chicago Board of Election Commissioners, and whereas 
Mila Livonez Adele used a fashion class assignment as inspiration to create a stunning avant-garde dress constructed almost entirely of Chicago's I Voted wristbands. Whereas Mila Livoni Zidel's fashion statement moved together, wove together looks from the 1920s and 60s, two of the most significant eras of advances in civil rights in the United States of America. And whereas Mila Livoni Zidel is now on the verge of serving again as a student election judge in this her senior year at Whitney Young High School. And whereas Mila Livoni Zadell also has joined the ranks of registered voters and will be casting her first ballot at the upcoming March 17, 2020 primary elections. Now, therefore, let it be resolved by the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago that the agency will proudly salute and display the fashion design creation by Mila Livoni Zadell as the first piece in this year's century celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. And let it further be resolved that this motion shall be spread upon the official record of the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago, and that a copy of this resolution, dated and approved this 11th day of February 2020, be presented to Mila Livoni Zidel. And with much Pride, I present this to you. Thank you. Would you like to just say a few words? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, it's a piece that I really care about, and I'm really proud of the message it sends and what I was able to say through creativity and how I was able to express myself. Thank you so much for recognizing it. At a time when a lot of people, especially younger people, but a lot of people in general are just turned off by the political process. I mean, turnout was down in Iowa, and it's never down in Iowa. What makes you excited about the opportunity to vote and the, the, just the process of voting? Well, um, I believe that all our voices all matter, and it's important to speak up for what we believe in and what we think is right and say what we want to say, give our two cents. So I think it's important to vote, and I think it's important to, yeah, just vote and give your own opinion on the issues. Let's talk about your inspiration, right? It's not often that kids your age think about voting as an inspiration for a class project. Take us back to when this first started. How did you even get this inspiration, and how did you come up with a way to do it? Um, you know, it was it came together really fast. I was trying to push an idea that I didn't really have a connection to, and I had saved the bracelets from previous elections because I knew I wanted to do something with them. Um, I had collected them over, I think, three, and all of a sudden it just came to me. I thought, you know, it's such an important time. I've served in these elections. I've seen the votes, and I know what's happening, and I'm going to vote soon. And I want to make a piece that reflects that, and I want it to say that it's important to vote, and there's power in voting. And what did your classmates say when when eventually came together and you presented it? Um, people really liked it. Uh, people were really excited about the message, and um, I think a lot of people. I know a lot of a lot more people at my school are going to serve as student election judges this year. I like to think that my dress played a part in getting them to do that. So, yeah. What about the reaction from your teachers? And then when you found out the board of elections wanted it, <laughs> where did that moment like that's huge? Um, yeah, I uh, my it was kind of a, people didn't really know I had made it until the fashion show. And so there was a big rush of people who were like, oh my gosh, it's amazing, I love it, um, which was kind of a whirlwind. Um, but um, over the summer when I heard from the Board of Elections, it was shocking. I mean, I, I never imagined anything like this would happen. Um, and I'm so excited that it did. Can I ask what made you want to become an election judge in the first place? Um, I heard about it from my parents, and I um, I just thought it was an amazing opportunity. And I had never, 
you know, I care about politics a regular amount, I think, for a, a person my age. And at the time when I served, I think I was 16. And I wanted to learn a little more about the system, and I wanted to get a little more involved. And how old are you now? I'm 18. So, you, okay, you're already turned 18. Yeah. <laughs> and how about your parents? I mean, did the, this has to be a little overwhelming for everybody involved. <laughs> it started with this idea that grew into so much. Yeah, I, um, you know, uh, I don't think either of them really knew. I made it all at school, and they, neither of them really knew what was gonna was gonna look like until the fashion show happened, and there were pictures, and we're talking about it. So when was the fashion show? Um, it was, I think, May yeah. of last year. Okay. Yeah. Where has it been this whole time? Have you, did you turn it in right away, or? Did um, I had it at home for oh, the whole summer until wow. about a month ago. Wow, that's amazing. Did you, did this inspire you to do more? I mean, are you contemplating doing something else? Yeah, um, I'm in fashion again this year, and um, this year as a Fashion 2 student, um, I'm creating a collection of looks. So I'll be in the fashion show again this year, and I'm working on my pieces. Are they voting related? <laughs> no, no, um, but they definitely have a central message. Um, yeah. I hope they have as much power as this one. That's amazing. Thank you. 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 And uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the min regular board meeting minutes of December 10, 2019. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. And is there a motion to approve the special board meeting minutes of December 16, 2019? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Next is the executive director's report, Mr. Goff. Thank you, Madam Chair board members, uh, just to give you a couple of updates, we are hopefully we're having a meeting with the new executive director of the Office of Emergency Management and Communication. We're going to do that this weekend. We're trying to set that meeting up for 3 o'clock this Thursday. There are a couple of things that have happened in the last couple of months, and we thought we'd bring everybody together. We then are also having a meeting with the uh, Department of Homeland Security and uh, the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, so we call these departments, so to get ready for the upcoming election. We wanted to let the board members know about that. Um, you've heard about uh, 175 West Washington. We're moving to 191 North Clark. Uh, the electricians are setting up everything today. Uh, our people moved the uh, boost set them up in the location. Hopefully we'll have more than 100 uh, voting stations there. Uh, I know people are talking about low turnout. I did not expect a low turnout, especially for early folks. I think we're going to get a large one. And that space is larger than we have at 175. The lighting's better. Everything is nice and it's right near all the hills. So I'm very happy about it. I'm also happy about it when we first started thinking about a super site and we used 15 West Washington. Uh, when 175 went down, I was a little worried. I have to tell you, the staff and everybody jumped into it and took care of it. It was really impressive to see the staff put everything together like they did. So I just wanted to look but it was within days of learning that we would not be able to use that site that we got a new site signed, sealed, and delivered. This, this I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, we, we did with the fall breaking down uh, in the street and cut the gas line and the electrical. So Dean's already started getting permits of Terra Ter Ter Washington Street to replay replace the gas line <laughs> and already had a general generator to go back to 175. But that would just be temporarily and it would it would be an interruption. So to have the staff do what they did is really impressive. And I just want the board members to be aware of that. 
So at this time, are we anticipating returning to 175 for the November election? The November election, but just for this, this one election. Uh, we couldn't afford the space. The space is very expensive, but we're bringing it out for it. We got it for less than what we're paying uh, now. The, the space at Clark and Lake is? Yes, it's less than what we're paying right now. We're, yeah, I think we're getting not by much, by about three thousand dollars. Right. Yeah, we that was uh, Walgreens up until January sixth, so we spotted that closing and were able to jump on that while it was hot. And we do have a relationship with uh, Walgreens Corporation and uh, Inter <coughs> Inter Park, Inter Park, which owns the property. So it was really it worked out really well. That one department. Um, I've also, with the new space, we've got a, a shy women vote ask me about early vote. They want to already uh, do a rally and bring people in to go to the location. So I think it's, we're going to get good feedback. Is, is there any, <coughs> have you had any conversation internally with respect to finding a permanent location for Super Saturday downtown? We got lucky with this one. All things closed in a month ago. Um, I mean. with, the, with the price of real estate downtown, uh, just to let you know that uh, 15 West Washington, when we were trying to get that space, that space was being leased out for 80000 a month. Mm -hmm. There's no way that we could, we could compete with something like that. And just, just so you know, this was plan B only because it's a prime location right next to the Clark and Lake stop, which is the busiest L station. But we also had a plan C at a retail operation that recently closed on State Street. We had a, a plan D, uh, block 37. We had a plan E in the lower level. So we, we try to look around the corner just in case something like this happens. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, the, the problem we have is it's too expensive to do a permanent location. For example, on off years when we don't even have an election, you know, we can't afford to pay rent for right. an empty space. Um, we, but, don't, we don't want to get into leasing out space that we're that we taking right. over. So. <clears throat> what I'm what I'm, what I'm suggesting is after this election, um, we should get some, some thought of finding a permanent solution, which is not necessarily leasing a space throughout the entire year. But there are other options that are space that we can know we can step into because we'll always be vacant. Um, it's just something to get thought to because God forbid in a situation where we don't have any retail space. Uh, this retail 175 gets rented and other retail spaces get rented. All of a sudden now we're just we're clamoring for uh, something. So. Yeah. And we are, that is something <coughs> we've always done. And we've been very fortunate to get block 37 where we're doing our judges training Of other things, uh, equip for equality, put together a year in report. I don't know if you received it. I sent that to the board members. This is just a draft copy. I have not even reviewed it yet. And it's all, it's along with uh, some leg federal legislat legislation that's being proposed to uh, introduce the Access Voting Act. The Access Voting Act. Um, I do have Mr. Rezizen here today to talk about our printing, uh, with the, with the number of cases that we have in judicial review. Printing's been slowed down, but I'd like to give, have you here to give a report, please. Commissioners, where we're at right now is uh, we printed all the Republican ballots. All Republican ballots have been printed. They've been delivered to the warehouse. They've been delivered to Hensley 3X data for ballot mailings. We released yesterday the Democratic federal ballots. Uh, the reason we were able to release those is that there is nothing being held on that ballot. The main Democratic ballot, we still have two cases that involve citywide uh, impact. One is the Jamison case, it was a circuit court judge, which is all of Cook County and Chicago. And the other one is a Krizlov case, which is in federal court. Um, we also have three other cases, one in the first ward, 
the ninth ward and the ninth rep district. Um, we can work around those three if we can get clear up the Jamison case and the Criswell case. We're getting into a very dangerous time to get these things printed, delivered, and for it to start pre -lab. We need 20 days, 10 for printing and 10 for pre -lab. We're really hoping to get a decision by Thursday or Friday so we don't lose the weekend for printing. That's really kind of where we're at right now. And just, uh, I mean, I, I assume we've, we've notified the judges about, um, you know, the, the time issue here? In the cases from our electoral board where we're, we're in court, yes, <clears throat> with the federal litigation and countywide litigation that we've heard about, uh, the attorney for the county clerk's office, James Nally, has certainly been informing the court of that. Is, expedite those cases. We ran into a little bit of a scheduling problem with our circuit judges who really do a great job uh, expediting the appeals of electoral board decisions, but they were leading training sessions for the new judges last week and then they have a mental health call this week. So a little scheduling snafus, but uh, we're getting our cases moved on. At what point can we go ahead and pull the trigger and start printing? If they take it on an appeal to a higher court, will we will get a decision from a circuit court if we go ahead? Yes. I mean, there comes a time when just out of necessity we have to print whatever the status quo is at that time. Uh, where we currently sit, uh, Jay Ramirez, who's a first board Democratic committee person candidate, was ruled off the ballot by the electoral board, and the court uh, the circuit court affirmed that decision to keep them off the ballot, but at the same time, because of the impending start to early voting, the court wanted us to put his name on the ballot just in case, because it would be better to start the early voting with his name on the ballot so people could vote, and then we would suppress those votes, which is an easier thing to do than to start an election without his name on the ballot and then have to put it on midway through. <coughs> So for the other candidates involved with our cases, they're still pending. They're all on the ballot, and we just start the election. If we need to suppress votes and put up notices later, we will if anything changes. I'm not expecting any changes. Thank you. But our printers are on standby. <coughs> Lake County Press, they know what the problem is. They've been through this more than once, so they're ready to go. So I just want to let you know. Oh, and Hensley, since we do have the Republican ballots uh, ready, we're going to start mailing this week. I'd like for them to get a time because we're doing a new ballots, new envelopes, and with the uh, intelligent mail of our clerks. So we're having a meeting later on this week with the post office one more time. So, so do, do they have a drop dead date then for the printing of the. Yeah, it's going to. <laughs> we're, we're going to start printing. Gary and I are going to sit down and talk. We just may roll. We were thinking about printing by uh, rotation, rotation order. order. That is so difficult to do that because there's so many different battle styles inside the rotation order. So we're still working on that. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll come up with an answer to that. Do we have any numbers on uh, vote by mail requests? Yes. Uh, Charles does. Yes, Commissioner. Um, as of this morning, we've processed 24,659 mail requests. Of that, 776 are the U.O. Collar Overseas, Uniform Overseas Citizen Voting. We received 5,933 last night, requests last night, that the vote by mail department processed by 9.15 this morning, so hats off to Sandra Spare and the vote by mail staff. Just to let you know that uh, with everybody voting, with the, doing this online, it makes it a lot easier at this agency. So we're pushing that. We've already mailed out over 300,000 uh, the emails, emails. The emails to who we have in the system right now, encouraging them to vote by mail. So that's why these numbers are coming in. Thank you, Mr. Goff. Um, we will now go to Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday, do you have anything further? Yes. Okay, um, great. As mentioned, our super site location has been changed to 191 North Clark. John Powell will start training of the 
early voting site administrators on February 19th, and the training for the early voting staff will begin on February 19th through the 23rd. There's uh, 10,342 election judges assigned of that number. 3,197 are returning judges that have already completed their training. 923 are new judges that completed training. There are 62 classes of training left for uh, returning judges, 57 classes for new judges, and 23 classes left for high school students. Our election coordinators, we have 1,375 that have been assigned. The number of trainings remaining is 51. The registration department are still cleaning up the files for the upcoming election and beginning to set up the public viewing area for the start of grace period voting and registration on next Wednesday. We have about 133 polling place vacancies. So Brandon Pickens and the uh, polling place investigators are working very hard and will have these vacancies filled. How, how does that compare to the previous election at this point? Yeah. This is higher. We're waiting. Uh, we have some pending uh, reviews from the Department of Justice. We're going to meet with them so we can expedite that. So this is a little bit higher than we, we like to see. And is it higher because of, of uh, it's, accessibility? Is it higher because people are just refusing us? It's both. I don't want to blame it on one. It's both. A lot of people don't want us for the, the small amount of money that we pay to go inside their location. And lastly, the warehouse is still moving forward with the receiving and testing of the new voting equipment to be deployed for our March election. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Uh, Mr. Allen? Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, so the first and most important video, uh, how to vote using the new voting equipment, was finished last week. That allowed us to start doing the emails to the vote by mail voters or with the invitation to vote by mail. Uh, with a link to that video embedded in the emails. Uh, so, because we know that 88% of those voters are actually going to vote in person, so it's important to use this opportunity to show them how the new voting equipment works. I'm sorry, say that again. You sent the email out to vote by mail voters? Well, it's not to vote by mail voters. I, let, me, let me restate that. It's our invitation to vote by mail, but it also had in there. Uh, a video on the new voting equipment so that if they don't vote by mail, which most of them won't, uh, most of our most of the participation we see is in early voting or um, on election day. So we included that uh, information in that invitation. So this is essentially every registered voter <coughs> for whom we have a email address. Correct. Okay. So the emails started going out uh, over the weekend and we had, as Charles said, a rather large number. We had 10,000 over the weekend uh, compared to getting, you know, four to 500 a day prior to that. And then uh, another large number again yesterday, about 5,000. So um, the mass mailing also is going to have a QR code on it with, uh, that lands the user to our, the section of our website with all of our how-to videos. So the next two videos that they're completing, they're putting the final touches on, are the early voting field trip, with, updated with the new equipment, um, and the uh, register to vote. And then the last one that we're uh, wrapping up is the vote by mail. We want to change some things in there to offer new information that they don't necessarily need a replacement ballot if they make a mistake, if they obliterate their mistake choice and then make a clear mark elsewhere with uh, notation such as, you know, this, not this, not, not there. Uh, we can actually go through the adjudication process and determine what their intent was. So we want to include that information now that we have a system that can detect that and flag it for the adjudication. Um, advertising, uh, we're preparing uh, information for early voting as well as signage for the new super site. 
Uh, we received a lot of inquiries last week related to system security and Iowa, especially in the wake of Iowa. And normally, if uh, you know, I, I operate from the premise that if BP has an oil spill, Shell doesn't comment. However, in this case, there were a lot of questions that were along the lines of uh, how can we be sure that this isn't going to happen in Illinois when our primary comes. So it was important to differentiate, the, you know, the, how a uh, uh, caucus is a party event literally run by rank amateurs as opposed to uh, a properly administered election where we've tested equipment, where it was certified at the federal level and the state level, and then we run it through a test. It's not the same as developing an app three weeks before a caucus and throwing it at you know, uh, party officials, and hoping that it will work. So uh, we received a lot of questions about that and uh, a lot of interviews were performed. As Lance mentioned, we're meeting with the Postal Service. Uh, they want to know the timing of our mass mailing as well as when we're going to start hitting the mailing with the vote by mail ballots. They want that to succeed. And that's about it for right now. And uh, well, uh, what are we doing on social media? Um, the, I mean, we're, we're posting the usual information such as information about today's events, uh, uh, but uh, we're working with Mick the Challenge. I've worked with Adam to try to come up with uh, all the rules for a social media competition uh, that would be eligible for high school uh, age students who are either um, living in Chicago, and it wouldn't be limited to those enrolled in high school, but high school age students either in, who uh, live in Chicago or who are enrolled in a Chicago high school or GED program or the like. Thank you. Um, we will now proceed uh, with old business. Uh, I think we uh, have tackled infrastructure projects and changes in election administration and voting equipment. Uh, we're, well, are we, are we uh, moving along with the voting equipment? And, uh, yes, we are moving <laughs> quite swiftly. Yes. Good. And uh, electronic poll books? Yeah. On schedule with the upgrade of stand. We that is in process and moving as well. Okay. Um, and legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two bills we're following are Senate Bill 3047. Uh, this addresses the issue of when someone registers electronically, registers to vote electronically through the State Board of Elections or through the automatic automatic voter registration systems. And then we receive their information electronically from those government agencies. The election code currently says that those people before voting have to uh, provide a signature to us on election day at the precinct. The, this amendment would broaden that so that the signature could be expressly provided to us before election day, which makes a lot of sense for anyone who wants to make sure that they're all squared away and ready to vote when election day does come. It also allows for them to provide the signature uh, when applying for a vote by mail ballot, so that it's just the statute now is clear that it's, it's not just that you have to show up in your precinct with a signature on election day, but you could also, for example, do it for early voting or vote by mail. So it broadens the ability to, to register through that electronic automatic voter registration system and through the state board of elections. Uh, Senate Bill 3122. Uh, would, would change the statement of candidacy forms uh, by all candidates uh, to include a telephone number and email address if they have one. Um, it's questionable as to whether the language makes it mandatory or not for ballot access purposes. It looks like it might just be optional, but it would be expressly provided in the suggested language of the statement of candidacy form. As you may recall, for our last round of the municipal elections, <coughs> we as an agency, not on the statement of candidacy forms, but as an agency, we voluntarily allowed the, uh, the, the candidates to provide us with such contact information. So this seems to be a step in the direction that we were already contemplating. That same Senate Bill 3122, if it has become law, would also change the citywide uh, signature requirements for the offices of Chicago Mayor, Clerk, Treasurer. Signature requirement is currently a flat rate of 12,500. The 
this would reduce it to a minimum of 5,000 with a maximum of 10,000. Um, it's not usually the board's position to have any opinion, I would say, as to what the signature requirement should be. That's really best left to the legislature. But administratively, that would uh, more than cut in half, perhaps, the amount of work for the signature uh, exams, the records exams that we do for our electoral board. So that might actually be helpful for us on the administrative level. It would also change the countywide signature requirement to the same level of a minimum of 5,000, maximum of 10,000. It's currently a percentage, 0.5% qualified electors, which can range anywhere from five to 8,000 or more. We're monitoring those things. Okay. Well, we got a budget here for the city of Chicago. Didn't we make some of uh, the commentary with respect to also the legislation that we want to move forward? That's correct. It sounded like there was support uh, from some of the aldermen on that uh, issue, and we do have a draft bill. Uh, that we have sort of manually sent out to those who might get it passed. Um, I think that we should start spreading it out among the aldermen so that they can get a better sense of it, particularly now that they're starting to show some support. Um, okay, so we to do that now? Yes. I'm sorry, and the, the particular bill you're, you're talking about? The uh, vote center legislation. <coughs> Excuse me, vote center uh, legislation. At the budget hearing, Last year, there was a lot of conversation around votes of it because of the lack of polling places. And so there was a big push, or a lot of it was down to a lot of vocal support by all of them to uh, help us uh, and convince state legislators to, to pass a vote center legislation. It, it feels like the tide is, might be turning, at least starting with the, the Chicago City Council, where people elected to offices tend to not want to see any change to the system that did successfully get them into office. <coughs> but they're starting to recognize the feasibility of 2,069 precincts. So, so I think we're starting Since, to But the question is, on the, um, is, isn't, is that something that the state must yes. approve as opposed to the city council? Yes. And so yes. the a city council vote would be just an endorsement? No, it, no, it wasn't. They, they weren't looking to, to vote on the matter. What they were looking to do was to provide some assistance with state legislators, their state legislators in their particular areas, okay. to help encourage them and say, look, we support, you know, uh, votes on the legislation and we will encourage you to pass the legislation. So it was more of a, what we will help kind of encourage, uh, 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 build build upon the tie that's already built. Okay. Now, Madam Chair, you know, there's plenty of legislation in Illinois that applies only to Chicago, and here would be another legitimate area where legislature would not necessarily have to open this up statewide. Right. Chicago, of course, has unique challenges with elections that smaller jurisdictions don't have. Right. Uh, we're not trying to force this upon other jurisdictions, but it sure would work well here. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, uh, the uh, county board also wants us to take a look at folks. Mm -hmm. They're very interested. They support us. A lot of the commissioners over there do support us. So we've got a lot more support than ever. Won't be the last I'd have to look at it for this uh, this cycle. I mean, we've we we spread this around already for this cycle. Um, but we continue the efforts. And generally, when we do have bills that we want to have um, picked up, how do we do so We've uh, worked with some lobbyists and just voluntarily asked them to assist with the efforts. And uh, that's worked pretty well. I think the board probably could benefit from a true lobbyist, but uh, right at the moment, that's, that's how it works, reaching out to those who are, are working with the legislators. Um, and that's, for example, when, when, the, when the aldermen show the support like that, and we can have to hand them the sample bill, then they can also reach out. And we've also contacted the House and Senate. Thank you. Um, we will now proceed to new business, and uh, we've already uh, taken care of the resolution uh, honoring Neela Lavoni Zadell. Um, we will now proceed with the short-term property use agreement between Urban Growth Property Limited Partnership and the Board of Election Commissioners uh, for the use of 191 North Clark Street as an early voting site. And we um, 
we uh, just talked about this briefly. And uh, this is as a result of the 175 um, West uh, Washington, not, yeah, 175 West Washington uh, uh, facilities. Significant electrical issues right now. There's no electricity. Okay. And um, so we have a. Uh, And in, with respect to uh, the urban growth property, which is the new property located on Lake and Clark, um, the uh, lease there uh, that we've negotiated is for fifty thousand dollars for the term. That we need. For the term. For the March election. Uh, and we will have to pay utilities. Uh, on top of that, whereas at 175 West Washington Street, um, there we were paying $53,000. $53,000 including utilities. Is that right? I believe it was plus utilities. We, we had originally tried to negotiate that uh, they would cover the utilities. Okay. Um, and uh, we will have uh, the uh, Lake and Clark facility. Uh, from uh, what's, what is the time period here? Uh, it would actually be from last week, Friday, mm -hmm. uh, through March 31st. Okay. Um, are there any further questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the short-term property uh, use agreement with Urban Growth Properties in the amount of fifty thousand uh, dollars through um, March? Did you say? March 31st, yes. 31st, 2020 for the, uh, for the purpose of uh, early voting in the uh, upcoming March 17th primary election. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, the next item is the ratification of a contract with Hensley for absentee ballot fulfillment in the 2020 general election in November. Um, Madam Chair, um, Ms. Fulton Walls did, did a great job procuring a contract for continued uh, ballot fulfillment. This is the mail house that's going to handle our ballots. She did negotiate a contract for both the March uh, primary this year and the, and the November general. Unfortunately, our agenda for the board meeting where this agreement was approved uh, two weeks ago, the agenda stated that it was only for the March primary whereas the agreement actually was for March and November. So now, with proper public notice, and it's listed on the agenda today, we just ask that you ratify that agreement for both elections. Right, and, and uh, nothing has changed uh, from uh, two weeks ago when we approved. That's uh, correct. The contract's already been signed and has not changed. Okay, so uh, the, mo the motion is to ratify the board's 2020 contract for mail-in ballot fulfillment for the March primary and the November general election in the total amount of $765,000 with the Hensley Company. Is there a motion to ratify? So Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Um, next is a legal report. Mr. Lasker? Well, frankly, we sort of touched on my legal report when Mr. Sisson was up there. I, I will just point out that uh, Candidate Jay Ramirez, who, who the circuit court affirmed that he should be off the ballot, and has appealed that decision. Uh, his attorney appealed it the same day that the circuit court ruled. We appreciate that. He's already filed a motion to expedite. I, I plan to get a response from the appellate court on that today. And then we've got uh, candidate Ty Craddock, the Democratic state rep in the 9th representative district. His hearing in the circuit court is this is next week, Wednesday. Anthony Beal is a Democratic committee person candidate in the ninth ward. This hearing is on the 14th. Okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Um, we have no financial report, uh, and I have not received any requests for public comment. Is there a need for executive session? No, not today. If not, Um, 
Mr. Beth, is there a need for uh, a meeting, a special meeting uh, next Tuesday, or should we just uh, do that at the call of the chair? Madam Chair, there's so many things that are going on. I think I'd like to do a meeting once a week. Mm -hmm. it's So why don't we, with, uh, uh, we will uh, start doing weekly board meetings. How about if I just uh, adjourn uh, and uh, until the next meeting, which will be at the call of the chair, and we can decide the exact date and time of, of the meeting. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.